Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. It's really nice to be here. <clears throat> um, I, I had the, it was Rebecca, it was beautiful to hear Rebecca singing because um, Rebecca came to an event that I spoke at in somewhere in Pennsylvania, I guess it was, right? And um, she said, you got to come uh, to Morgantown. And I thought, well, I've got a connection here, and that's what I got to tell you about. It makes me kind of excited. My wife, um, her father is. He went to West Virginia University, and her grandfather worked for Appalachian Power his entire life. So there's kind of a cool connection. And I knew that I'd get to spend about 10 hours in the car with her. So um, it's very nice to be here. A uh, lot of great connections, as Sarah was pointing out. So, um, <clears throat> so I, it's kind of funny, you know, you come, you, like, I, in my job right now, I'm putting a lot of miles in the airplane, which is one of those big, huge contradictions. I'm, my carbon footprint is outrageous, but um, as Tom pointed out, we're, LEED is becoming a global system, and I want to tell you a little bit about that, and I want to help you understand, I want to tell a couple stories about how we're impacting change and how you're part of that change that's occurring. Okay, so um, just, to, just to give you a couple thoughts of what it's like to start. I, I, I've traveled quite a bit before, but I'm really getting to know the world pretty well in this position right now. This is Shanghai. The Shanghai Tower uh, is becoming a lead project. Where do I need to point this? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Shanghai uh, and Beijing, even though it's uh, experiencing outrageous record poor air quality, is also a place where LEED is taking off like crazy. Um, about five years ago, we had 200 projects. They were all American corporations that were bringing LEED into China. Now we have 3,000 projects there, and uh, about half of them are Chinese companies. As the, as the economy begins to slow in Beijing, or in Shanghai especially, what's happening is that um, the companies that were buying and selling, they were building as fast as they could possibly build, sell, and then go build something else. They're realizing that there's value in holding onto the property so the, the, the quality of what they want to own is changing. And they're digging into what quality means. That's what we do. That's really, I think, what this conference is about. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about today. Some other examples. Uh, this is a large, uh, there, it's a... Uh, 15 core and shell buildings, lead core and shell buildings in Shanghai. Um, this is Krakow. We spend a lot of time in Europe. I'll show you some of the numbers of what's going on in Europe. Uh, these are uh, beautiful lead buildings in Abu Dhabi. You step outside the desert, it's <clears throat> 140 degrees, and you walk inside this area between the buildings, and they've channeled the wind going through these buildings, so it's less than 100 degrees. It's unbelievable. It feels like it's air-conditioned in, uh, in the exterior, but it's because of the way they've shaded the buildings and channeled the wind. This is Sao Paulo. Um, I want to give you, I want to talk a little bit about Brazil today because I, I, I feel this affinity between this place and Brazil. We, I spend a lot of time in Brazil because there's so much activity there too. We've seen 200% growth and lead in Brazil in the last year. It's just taking off like crazy. And you can see that Brazil is this place that's like a jungle, right? I mean, it's just outrageous. Sao Paulo, it's, it's unbelievable. It's this endless sea of buildings, 40-story buildings and then endless, endless people, one of the fifth, I guess it's about the fifth largest uh, uh, population in the world in a single place. And in these parts of the world, everyone's going, you know, they're, they're, everyone's collecting in, in these big cities in Asia, South America, and they're, we're really having to figure out how can we address these issues that we're all gonna face, because here's the thing. The global, that discussion that we had in the 90s about the global economy, you know, we were, some of us might have even been standing in line saying, let's stop globalism, let's, or, or standing out in the picket line saying, stop globalism, stop this, this global thing from happening because it's going to ruin our sense of who we are as, as, a, as a local group or as a regional group. That's done. 
It's over. It is a global economy. We are connected. There is this connection that we have with what's going on in the rest of the world that we can't avoid. And that's a lot of really what, what I, I think is the message we need to take with each other, like that connection, the things that we do, the little things we do here have a lot to do with the little things that add up to what's going on there. So, we're coming out of Washington, D.C. today in the car, and, you know, we get up over the hills, and we get outside the area, outside Frederick, and it just starts getting prettier and prettier, and you start seeing nature, and you start um, just feeling, just breathing a little bit easier, and it's beautiful, and we're seeing the wind, and the snow starts blowing like crazy, and, and you see these little circular things, tornadoes of snow going. And then, you know, I see that, I haven't been to West Virginia in a long time, I see that name Cumberland, and just pops into my head, I can't, I can't wait much longer, Melinda. The sun is getting high. I can't help you with your troubles if you won't help with mine. You know that song, Cumberland Mines? So I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking music and nature fit with this place. Muse, and it was so great to have Rebecca get up and sing about the hills. Music and nature fit with this place. And Brazil, music and nature fit with that place in a way that's very similar. There's this connection to nature there that I think you have here. That, that was such a great song. That, and that connection, I, well let me just tell you a song that I'm really fascinated by that, that has a lot to do with this idea of small things and connections and how we create change. So this guy, Milton Nascimento, and do any of you know him? He's a Brazilian singer, a great Brazilian singer. He's got this song called Beja Flor, which is hummingbird. And the Brazilians love hummingbirds because they're everywhere. But this line in the song is, Beja Flor me manjo embora, trabalhar e abrir os olus. Beja Flor me manjo embora. Hummingbird, come take me away. Do the work to open my eyes. Hummingbird, come take me away. Do the work to open my eyes. Now I like that because this idea of opening our eyes fits very well with music and nature, right? And change fits very well with music and nature. Music, music is the embodiment of change. Music is never static. It is always moving. And nature is exactly the same way. If you look at a forest over a long enough period of time, it'll look the same as a sand dune does in a big storm. It'll move, it'll shift, it'll change. It's always changing. Change is who we are. Change is what we're about. And the reason we're in this room is because we are in the business of change. The real question is not whether change is going to happen. It is not a question of whether change is going to happen. It is totally a question about whether or not we want to guide that change, whether we want to be involved with it, whether we want to be part of shifting it so when, it change, when that change occurs, our children have a better place to be. That's a big question for us in this global economy, isn't it? Because we all know, we all know there's some serious things going on that we have to address. So this is our kitchen at home, and we have hummingbird feeders on both sides of the house. And it's just a blast to sit and watch these things because they're so teeny, and they travel so far, and they do so much. They're such powerful, little, teeny creatures. And they're so full of what change is about. So let me talk, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the nature and the speed of change and how we're involved with it. And here's one thing I know for sure. In nature, change ha tends to happen in two ways. It happens very quickly or catastrophically or it happens very slowly. Did you ever, you, do you know, did you ever read uh, The Sun Also Rises by uh, Hemingway? Did you, you know the, the, the quote about, um, the Hemingway quote where the guy is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he answers, very slowly and then very suddenly. <laughs> Ch change 
happens very quickly in very bad ways, and we know all kinds of examples of it. We've lived it, right? I don't, have, I don't even have pictures of New York City, but you've all seen those pictures. Right? It's amazing what the discussion is going on now in New York City and why the president is even talking about climate change when we haven't talked about it in years. Because it's not a question of being scared or worrying about the science. The fact is we know we can, we can do things about it. There's things we can do about making a better world. But slow change, slow change is good change. Think about it. Almost everything in your life that's happening slowly, your children, the things that, that you bring sustenance to, the things that you help grow, the things in your garden, the trees that you've watched grow over your life, those things happen very slowly. They don't happen fast. Now this is counterintuitive to all of us who tend to think, oh my God, the world's falling apart, we have to move faster, we have to fix everything, we have to like, you know, we have this, this feeling of fixing that's somehow connected to us thinking that we are the mechanics for the world. That somehow we're, the world will pull into our, our garage and we'll get it all fixed up and it'll be fine. If only we can come up with the right solutions. But it's not about solutions. It's about slow nurturing and slow change and being connected to things. That's what LEAD is all about. LEAD is this tool of very slow change. Slow, minute, small change that travels across the globe and that it connects us in a way that we might not understand otherwise. Now it's a very simple system, right? I don't know, how many of you have used LEAD or even know, I mean I gather you kind of, how many of you, anyone have, have anyone, has anyone not heard of LEAD? Okay, so you've all heard it. It's a very simple system that, that ha is based on checkpoints. It's like um, uh, Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts or Girl Scouts. Did any of you do Cub Scouts or Girl Scouts? Right, yes. <laughs> so <clears throat> you have that book and you do the things and you check the, 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 the things off and, and you move on to a new level. LEAD is almost identical. You have a scorecard in LEAD, but you're dealing with issues on your site, water issues, energy issues, materials issues, indoor environmental quality issues, and you have a score that then ranks you between certified silver, gold, or platinum. It's amazing how ridiculously simple this system is. And it's amazing how it's, it has, it's so American in so many ways, and because of that it has this outrageous appeal in other parts of the world. It's just, it, people just love this idea that they do something good and they get a point. <laughs> <laughs> So it's working. It's working because it connects us and we understand each other when we're talking about it. Right now we're in 135 countries. We have projects in 135 countries and LEED is growing um, approximately 50% of all the square footage that was registered last year was outside the United States. That just gives you a sense of the kind of connection that we're having. We've created something called the LEED International Roundtable. I'll show you that in a second. Let me give you, these are some of the numbers that are happening with LEAD just to give you a sense of the type of change that we're starting to see, that you're a part of. If you're working on LEAD project, projects, you're a part of it. 15,500 certified projects, 50,570 registered and certified projects. That means like projects that have come into the system. 57,000 of them around the world. 50,570, I'm sorry. One and a half million square feet certified every day since January 2010. That's a lot of square footage. That, that basically means it's a big system that's up and running and it's really starting to create change. Now the reality is the change in these certified numbers aren't anything like the change that that, that whole system is having on the whole market. Almost all of you that are building are building differently today because than you would have before because of LEED. That, that means that that small change that you're doing on these projects related to credits spreads out into the industry. And we've seen more change in the building industry in the last 10 years than we have in the car industry or the food industry or the um, textile industry. 
more change than anything because of all of these small things that we've been doing, these teeny little credits that add up to points that are changing the entire industry. 2.25 billion square feet certified, several trillion dollars of total uh, money in the system, nine and a half billion square feet registered and certified. We've got this group called the LEED International Roundtable. There are now 30 countries on it. We sit around as a group and we talk about how do we use this system to transform building and improve building every place on the planet. So again, the reason I want you to know that is because you're part of it. You're doing it, and the things that you've done that have set in motion the system are what's creating that change. These are just the newest members. We finally got China on the round table, and we've come up with a methodology for how we're using uh, lead credits. We, we're calling them alternative compliance paths, which essentially allow technical development now to happen in different parts of the world. We started in Europe. We started a group working there. We have a group uh, that's going to start in China this year and a group that's going to start in South America. But what I really, I want to just tell you a couple stories about that change and help you understand kind of how I see those, these little things that add up into something big. The first one is Brazil. Now, Brazil um, got the World Cup and decided they're, you know, they, they, they were going to do the World Cup and they were going to do 11 stadiums or 12 stadiums total that were going to be done by this year or are going to be done by this year. Um, but several years ago, I guess it was three years ago, there were two guys, lead accredited professionals in Brazil, who decided, you know, if we're going to do the World Cup, they should be green. So what they did was they, uh, they came up with a plan, they called it Copa Verde, they essentially wrote a paper, and they sent it to the government. They put it in front of a couple, uh, couple faces, and it turns out that the government said, okay, we'll buy into this, we'll certify these projects. This is a very good idea. And they tied seven and a half billion dollars of financing uh, to the LEED certification process. We've been down in Brazil several times now where they're basically trying to figure out how do they release funds for these stadiums um, related to how, when we're certifying and how far along they're getting. But my favorite story is Brasilia. Now, if any of you are architects, you know Brasilia is, it's, the, it's like the icon of modernism, right, that's been stuck kind of in the middle. It was this utopian sense of modernism where the machine is the ruler and the machine will kind of guide, the machine reflects who we are as people and guides how we function with each other. And Niedermeyer built this amazing system as a utopian system in the middle of nowhere as the capital of Brazil. I, I mean, I remember when it was getting built as a kid. I suspect many of you do, right? And the governor of Brasilia now decides to do a lead platinum stadium, the first in the world. And what he, in order to do this, he's got to think of all these things. He's got to think, okay, I want to actually make it so people can get to this stadium in a way that they wouldn't have to drive. Now this is the city of machines. This city is built around cars. And what he does is he brings his, his uh, a transportation secretary in and he says I want 90 percent of the people in this city to be able to get to the stadium without a car and they completely change how transportation transportation is happening in Brasilia he's he's got a five megawatt uh, solar array up on the top of the thing that's feeding um, power back into the grid all day long uh, all the water is saved underneath it's a it's a beautiful system that they've set up that now is, it's an icon of how the people are, are dealing with each other and, and sitting with each other that represents something completely different than they've ever had. It's beautiful. It's a really cool little thing. So the second story I want to tell you is about Rachel Carson and what we're dealing with in LEAD as we're trying to create change. So as you all know, we're in the middle of changing the version of LEED where uh, we just closed our fifth public comment for LEED version 4. And that fifth public comment, after fifth public comment, we've had 23,000 individual comments on any of the credits and we've responded to every one of those comments. 
But of course, when you're creating change, and we're, when we're creating change on a single small little thing, a credit, it gets, it, it, cre it creates an impact. And I want to help, I want to share with you kind of what that feels like and what's going on with that, in that impact. And I want to tell you about it by telling a story about Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson, and it, it has a lot to do with what's happening here today. I, I can't tell you how important I think it is that you have utility plant guys up here talking at your green building conference. That that's, means you're in the right, you're heading in the right direction. You're, you have the right conversation going on. So Rachel Carson, 50 years ago, writes this book, Silent Spring. How many of you have read it? Right, it's a pretty interesting book, a pretty great book, really set into motion uh, what we see now as the environmental movement of today. Rachel Carson uh, was a great writer, and she also, she'd already won a book prize, right, and she wrote this book and was really focused on one thing. She wanted to make sure that people understood the danger that was in their lives. She focused on DDT in this book, but she wanted to get people involved in their world in ways be, in, with the people that she knew had time. So she focused on writing this book for housewives, housewives in the 50s that she knew had time on their hands, after the war especially, and part of this suburban world that was getting built up. She wanted them to be taking action. So she called these things, she, she called people to action in citizen brigades. My mother happened to be in one in Northfield, Minnesota, where I grew up. It was called Hatpin, um, Housewives Alert to Pollution in Northfield, <laughs> right? And but 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 like it was a big deal. They I I would I grew up wearing these weird little buttons, you know, about all the different stuff that was happening in um, in the community, and we were connected to it in a way. But it was because of Rachel Carson and the, and her call for getting involved. Now, one of the things Rachel Carson did in this book was. She said several things that were fairly inflammatory at the time. Because she knew in the 50s, I don't know how, how many of you were here then, um, you know, remember duck and cover? Remember, like, be, remember growing up in junior high and getting under your desk after, you know, because you, and knowing where the civil defense uh, uh, place was to go because you never knew if a nuclear bomb was gonna be coming? She knew that everyone was scared to death of nuclear war. And so she compared DDT to nuclear war. Now that got people's attention. That got them really worked up and got them paying attention. But what she did at the same time was create a severe enmity. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about. DDT, by the way, was used, it was interesting because it was used during the war to basically uh, de-louse soldiers, and it was a very effective uh, de-lousing mechanism during the war. But after the war, there was a huge glut of it, and there also was a huge glut of pilots. This combined with the US, um, uh, the US goal of becoming the number one producer of food in the world led to just massive use of DDT all over the place, which was having a huge impact on wildlife, much more than it was having an impact on human health. But it was, a, it was a serious thing to deal with. And she loved wildlife. She cared so much about these birds that she saw starting to go away because of this spraying. But here's what happened that I think we really need to pay attention to today. What she set up, no, what she started in motion with this idea that like, you say something and make it real and hard and you create a very clear picture of who's on the right side and who's on the wrong side, what she set in motion was a series of people that worked so hard against her for 50 years that we went backwards for so long. Right? It was, it's been 50 years of marketing dollars going into very sophisticated ways of helping us understand why we shouldn't even care about any of this stuff why we're fine, why everything is okay, why we don't have to worry. But that's not the case. But, but the reality is, Tosca and, and the issues that 
Tosca and issues that, that we deal with relative to toxicity and how we deal with these issues and uh, how they in fact Im impact our health have gone almost nowhere in the, our federal government for many, many years, since the late 70s. Largely because this whole machine was set in motion for many years. Now, here we are again. We did this little teeny credit in lead where we wanted to say, if you're building a green building, you should know what's in this material. And you should be able to decide whether you want to put that thing in your building. You should know if there's something that might impact your children, if you get too much of it. You should know that there, there should, if there's something there that might be in the air that you breathe. And that's created some real havoc for us. There's a group that came out at, at after third public comment. They came and looked at this, um, at this credit and they said, you know what, this is basically saying, you're basically telling people not to buy our stuff. And they said, if you don't take this credit out, we're gonna go and make the federal government stop using LEED, or get the federal government to stop using LEED. We're gonna get state governments to stop using LEED, and we're gonna get um, your common members, our member, member companies that are members of your association and our association, we're gonna get them to work against you too. So it was quite a threat. <clears throat> and we go, I mean, we've dealt with these people before and we deal with them in different ways. But what these guys, these guys know what they're doing. Within two weeks, they had 18 US senators sign a letter that went to the General Services Administration that said, uh, General Services Administration, LEAD is unscientific um, and uh, it should not be used by the federal government. And then they basically showed us a list. Maybe I'm, by the time I'm done, I'm going to figure out where to point this thing. They basically showed us a list um, of who they've been funding to run for Congress in different parts of the country because we got form letters in from about 50 different congressmen and governors that were basically telling us exactly the same thing. LEAD is unscientific. And should not be used any place where tax dollars are trying to improve buildings. I find these letters, they've been sitting in my office for a while and I finally got them out and scanned them. They're a powerful testament to how our system works. And we should know it, this is how our system works. Big money controls little decisions. Now, what do we do about it, right? What do we do about it? It's actually quite simple. We keep doing lots of little stuff. We stay really involved. We stay connected to how we do things that help guide decision making. We let the people that represent us, you know what, you know what really cr just drives me crazy about these letters? There's nothing that is close to representation in any of them. Nobody's represented in these. These are not your representatives. So how do we get our representatives to do things and act the way we want them to do? We talk to them, right? We need to do that more, right? We need to talk to our representatives. We need to let them know how we feel. We need to also show them that we want to take action in certain ways. This isn't a, it's not a political question. The real question right now is how do we make sure that we don't set into, so into motion another 50 years of us versus them? Because it's not us versus them, it's all of us together. So what we're doing right now, just so you know, it, I'm very excited about it, we've set into motion a series of meetings with all of the chemical companies that have been involved with a lot of this work and we're sitting down and talking and they're really interesting discussions. They're frank discussions. I like, I like what was said uh, by the gentleman before uh, basically pointing out it's not always easy. <laughs> you know, you have to face the realities of life. It's true. But that, the realities of life are that the small things we do now, these teeny little things about points and credits, 
will change the way our children live in this world. We can do that. The change is going to happen. What are we going to, how are we going to guide it? How are we going to help it? So, I keep thinking that like, the way, the things, the things that I do to save myself, you know, things like taking care of myself, eating breakfast, going on a bike ride, going on a walk, um, trying to be healthy, going to the doctor, the things I do to save myself are very similar to the things we need to do to save the world, or the things that I need to do to save the world. And I don't need to get overwhelmed with this huge burden of, oh my god, I have to change the federal government? <laughs> or I have to change like how all water happens? Or I have to change every power plant? No. What if instead of thinking about all of water, I think about the water in my sink? What if instead of thinking about all of humanity, I worry about the person next to me or my neighbor? What if, a, if, about, what if instead of worrying about energy and how it's happening and how it's not happening, I think about how much I love energy. What an amazing gift energy is to us. And why would I want to waste it? How silly. <laughs> See, we, we have the ability to be involved in the thing that we want to have happen. And there's room for everybody. There's room for everybody from the oldest person on the planet to the youngest person on the planet. There's room. Beja flor me manjo imbora, trabalhar e abriro solos. And I got to read you the, just the last part of this song. He adds two more parts of it. Mina floresta di gioia, tema agua, tema agua, tema quella immensidad, tema sombra di floresta, tema luz de corazón. My forest of jewels. It has water. It has water. It has all the immensity. It has the shade of the forest. It has the light of the heart. It has the beauty of the hills. It has the beauty of music. That's our work. That's our work to open our eyes and to do small things every day to create major change. Thank you very much.